Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. I'm delighted. Uh, what I'm going to do today is not talk you to death for the next three hours, because I notice it's a three-hour workshop, which uh, is too much. What I hope to do is give you a little bit of background on why we choose astronomy and space science and the schools as an inspirational program. Then let you play with some of the new resources so that when you go home, you have resources that you can use. I think it's very, very important. And then finally, I want to finish off with how, over a period of six years, this was not a quick fix. Over a period of six years, we finally got astronomy embedded into the curriculum in Northern Ireland under encouraging the further embedding of astronomy and space science throughout the UK <coughs> curriculum system. So just a, a basic overview, I'll do a little bit of background on astronomy because I'm not sure how many of you know anything about astronomy, so just a brief background. Uh, building the case, now when I say building the case for space in education, I don't mean the policy, I'm talking about how we lobbied our government to get the resources that we wanted into embedded education rather than peripheral after school activities. There's a big difference, as you know, between something that happens in class time and something that happens after school. It has more worth. Uh, new resources, we will have a play. The, the internet is a bit slow, so for some of the online resources, I will, I will have to be the old style teacher from the front, I'm afraid. But then hopefully you will have time to play with this stuff yourself. And I will give you all of the websites and web addresses at the end for you to go away. And all the software that I'm going to use that is sitting on your systems is completely free. So that's really good news for the bursar in your school. It does not cost any money. And curriculum development, I'll show you what that looks like at 11 to 14 years old, which is our lower secondary stream. And what we were doing now for the 15 to 18 year olds, it's in development at the minute. And then Celestia and Stellarium are virtual simulators. Celestia is a simulator of the solar system and, and our galaxy. So I will let you have a play with the, the, the system so you can get comfortable with this. And Stellarium is a planetarium uh, software that allows you to look at the night sky at any time in history, present or future from anywhere on planet Earth. So you can take it back and it's multilingual. So we'll see how we use that. I heard, I, I'm glad I came yesterday afternoon because I was not, I was not sure if you were used to what sort of pedagogy you were using in schools. I heard somebody mentioning PBL. What did that stand for? Project based learning. learning, yeah. So for me, I would see that project based as personal capability skills. It's developing the self, developing a person as an individual so they can be a more informed member of society. Could it mean anything else, PBL? Somebody mentioned it on a slide and they said it was a mistake, but I don't think it was. It was actually yourself. Problem based, problem -based learning, yeah, problem based learning, which is looking at thinking skills, so getting students to look at data in the case of astronomy to look at data, look at the information that's derived from space technology, come up with innovative approaches to how to use that data. And I'll explain, that is very important in future society. That is very important. Could it mean anything else? Our Russian colleague gave a talk yesterday, and you were talking about entrepreneurship and innovation. So product-based learning. And when I say that, I talk about the services that can come out of using space technology. So applications, devices, getting our young people to realize how to use that technology to be the future series of innovators, the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs. Now, I'm not going to use STEM. I think we have seen SET and STEM, and there are so many acronyms uh, within education around the world that we all get used to. I'm going to use MICE because I think that's more basic. It's about motivating. What, what do teachers do? And importantly, how to engage with the children. So this works both ways, because to motivate the children, the teachers have to be motivated and confident in using the tools, which is why I'm happy to be here today. Inspire, if I hopefully inspire some of you, that inspiration then will rub off. You'll want to do this with the students that you teach by communicating to them, and very importantly, getting them to engage in the subject, which uses the, 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 uh, the brains, the, the, the task of leader but not this chalk and talk type exercise where it is the students that are actually developing 
what they're doing themselves. Very important. Um, if you've got a bit of paper in front of you, if any of you have a bit of paper, can you just write this down for me? So topic or thing, curriculum, and I mean, what I mean by curriculum is the curriculum where you come from, because I do not know your curriculum, and skills development opportunities. And as we go through the workshop today, I would like you to be thinking how you would embed these within your existing curriculum. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm going to come back and ask you at the end. So if you want to work in teams or whatever, that's fine. But just think, how would you use these within your curriculum, the, the tasks and programs that I'm going to show you? Um, this is just an overview. Again, I was not sure if you're aware of the project-based learning and thinking skills and personal capabilities. So these are just some of the skills. Science, maths, creativity, ICT, communicating, communicating with others, communicating uh, with peers, communicating with the teachers, with the learners, self-management, being able to take ownership of something, deadlines, citizenship, and teamwork, and working with others. Now, why use space? astronomy at all. Why, why use it? Why use it in the classroom? A lot of people think astronomy you need to go outside at night. You know, this, you know, or you live in a big city with street lights everywhere. You cannot see anything. So how do you just do, use astronomy during the day? Well, one of the things I want to talk about is this subtle change to assessment. Why we use astronomy. I'm just putting up one idea. You've seen several of these. I said state the way basically to measure gravity. In most curriculum you will have some methodology or an experiment that says this is how we measure G, and if you can if you can repeat that on a piece of paper, you pass your exam. You get a tick box. But what we're saying, and I hear our colleagues yesterday were saying the same thing. You just change the V to state a way to measure G, and that gives the student the opportunity then to engage and try innovative methods of measuring G. So they take ownership of what they are trying to achieve, rather than you just firing the stuff out, and then repeating it in an exam, it's, it's important we go this way. And the problem is, of course, there are a lot of resources in every subject. In astronomy, you're going to see, I have a multitude of resources to show you. But the problem, of course, for you as a teacher is if you are working within a restrictive curriculum, you have your targets to meet, your students must pass the exam to go on to third level. So. What we want to try and do with astronomy, and what we're doing here in, in well, Northern Ireland and trying to encourage in the UK, is a change to the assessment to measure these skills, the metrics to measure those skills beside academic rigor. And I passionately believe if you can get the students to engage with the subject, they are more likely to engage academically as well. If you're losing the basic skills, there's a better chance they will then take up the academic rigor. From an astronomy point of view, it's also important that young people do know about this because in most countries space is paid for by the taxpayer so we're not trying to turn everybody into astronomers but what we do want are knowledgeable and informed citizens who realize the importance of the endeavor may not understand the science but realize the importance of the endeavor wow lovely image we're very lucky in astronomy that we do have a very visual subject to engage people when I look at a, an image like this, and I don't expect you to know, does anybody actually know what this is, by the way? So there's no astronomers. Okay. There's one at the back, so he might know something. <laughs> He's saying, no, I'm not sure. Um, but let's, let's forget about the astronomy. Let's think about how, imagine putting this up at the start of a lesson, okay? What questions could you ask? Just fire, what questions could you set up around an image like that? What sort of questions? Yeah, what are, what are the colors? The colors are, you know, we've highlighted the colors here. It's, it's been a false color, but we're looking at different elements, the fundamental elements, the chemistry of the universe. That's the stuff that makes up you and me and everything around us, you know? That's star stuff. You are made of stuff that was once inside a star. Anything else? What, what other questions? The density of matter. Yeah, how dense is it? I mean, can you fly through it? Is it really particulate? Is it a sign? Anything else? What about size scale? Or, yeah, what scale is it? No, how, how do you measure something like this? You know, how, how do you measure things in space? That's quite abstract for young people. How do you measure that? Well, measure things in the classroom, but how do you measure space? That's a, a really good question. The distances, how far away is it? You know, there's a lot of stuff there. 
I'll, I'll put you out of your misery, by the way. Uh, for, this is actually a star that is dying. It's called Eta Carina. Um, can you see this large ball? When large stars die and start dying, they throw off their outer atmosphere. Okay? And all of this material, if you look over here, can you see these white dots? These are young stars being born out of the material coming from Eta Carina. So in this one image, you have star death, star birth, and you have the material that makes up everything around us. So really good question. You can get kids to research this. There's lots and lots of images you can research on the internet and get children just to engage with the image. Let's start. Another image. Anybody want to have a guess at this one? It is Saturn, but we're actually not looking at Saturn at all. Yeah, so very good. This is the rings of Saturn. This is taken by a probe, a sensor, sensor technology, that is currently going around Saturn and its moons, called uh, Cassini, the Cassini Orbiter. This is raw data. I didn't show you a pretty picture. You can actually go and give you the websites at the end. You can go online and actually see what did it take today. You can actually see what did the spaceship see today around Saturn. And a little bit of the science. It's fantastic. And you can see here the rings. There's thousands and thousands of them really widely spread out, but they're only about one kilometer thick. So we will see later, because I'm going to take you all to Saturn later. And we're going to go and simulate the tour of Saturn on the computers, and you'll see how thin they are. And here we're seeing two moons. This isn't Saturn. Saturn's over here somewhere. The one in the foreground is called Enceladus. There may be life, believe it or not, underneath this ice-covered ocean. There's an ocean under there. There may be life there. We're sending probes. We don't know. And behind it is Titan, the, planet, uh, the moon Titan. And if you look, do you notice it's, it's sort of a blurred, a blur edge? Can you see that? It's fuzzy. That's because it's got an atmosphere. And we think the atmosphere of Titan may be similar to the atmosphere of Earth four billion years ago. So it's really cool. We can look at these things and try and compare and contrast with what we know and perceive around us. I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll know what planet this is coming from, because it's been on the news a lot. Okay. This is Mars. This, is, this yeah. was actually taken two days ago. This is the other really good thing about astronomy. There's always new science, new images. And this is coming from the Curiosity, the, the, the Mars rover on the surface at the minute. It's just started warming. It took its first sample yesterday, and it's measuring it, so we don't know what's going to be in there. And looking at this, you can see different colors. This is uh, slightly enhanced, but more or less real color. You can do geology. You can ask students, you know, where would you find this on Earth? You know, would you find anything that looks like this? Will you see these areas? Is this to do with water? Is it to do with wind? What's going on? And you can test these hypotheses. And you can use things like Google Earth and Google Mars. If you didn't know that, there's a Google Mars. You can Google Mars and travel around Mars and look at the comparisons. And there's lots of free teaching resources. Again, later, I will be showing you and letting you have a go with all the resources. It's a real plethora of resources out there. The other good thing for me is that astronomy is a visual subject. So if you're sitting there and you do not understand a word I'm saying, at least you've got pretty pictures. Okay, so I, I, I am actually conscious that Irish people talk very quickly. So please do say if I'm going too fast, just to slow down. This is me in slow mode, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is me in slow mode. All right. Okay, so. Brilliant images. And of course, the human endeavor, human spaceflight, man's spaceflight. We've all heard about the sad loss, of course, of, of Neil Armstrong recently. But this is also, from, from our gener my generation, I think, an incredibly iconic image. This is the International Space Station, a truly international collaboration. This is the size of a soccer pitch. This is a big, big, big machine. And what's this? It is, it's a space shuttle. And this is the last picture ever taken. <coughs> the space shuttle has been grounded. It will no longer fly again. It's now museum pieces. This is the last time the space shuttle will ever be up in space. This is the end of an era. It only happened a couple of months ago. And now we're moving into the third era of manned spaceflight, which will be privately owned. You've heard of uh, Virgin Galactic and Richard Branson. You can pay to go to space. And SpaceX, or a dragon, they have already sent a spaceship up here, a privately owned spaceship. So it's becoming, the whole, the whole uh, idea of space travel is completely changing. There are lots of stories and things you can do about this. I heard about an elevator from the space elevator. Yeah, using the nanotubes to go up, yeah. 
I don't know if I'd like to be in the elevator as it gets near the end. <laughs> I'm certainly not coming down again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course. I mean, you probably heard about this guy recently that jumped from the edge of space here. Yeah. That's a pretty mad yeah. thing. He broke the sound barrier with his head. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, it, so there's a lot of stories you can base around this kind of stuff. And videos. This is real, it's not an animation. This is what the astronauts see as they look out. This is the European Coppola module on board the space station. And they're actually looking out this window, that's what they see. And that's not far off the sort of speed you're going at. You are traveling at over 20,000 kilometers per hour. You're traveling really, really quickly. You can see we're starting to head over the desert here. And these sort of videos, these images, can really be used to inspire people in all sorts of ways. I'm going to show you another one. I don't want to run over this too much. Somebody showed a lovely image yesterday of the Earth at night. Well, here's what it really looks like. This is a video. So there's the Aurora, by the way, that's the Northern Lights. You can see, there's Ireland, I came from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's Belfast, Dublin, we are here, somewhere, London, okay. Who's from Paris? Who's from Paris? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paris, 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 there's the street lights. So you can see the effect of mankind on the surface of the planet. And you can measure this stuff. There's, there's projects where you can actually look at the light and try to work out the light pollution, actually measure that. You know, that's really important. And I, mean, I just think these sort of videos, if you start a lesson with something like this, it's very inspirational. You know, it's just, how do you get, how do you use this material within a classroom? Okay. That was very pretty, but I have to move on. But of course, as I say, you don't have to go into space to look at the stars. You can do it from the ground. Um, you know, the history of how we perceive the sky, and the history of how every country and every nation perceives the sky could be different. But it's still the same stars. In the Northern Hemisphere, the Chinese look at the same stars as us, but they interpret them differently. So it's a very nice, non-contentious way to look at the world under one big umbrella. And already, by the way, this is not an alien spaceship coming to take us away. It's just a cloud, okay? That's a cloud. Um, but you can see the majesty of the night sky, the stars. And again, the questions, you know, how old, how far is there life out there? That's a big question. Lots of questions you can use. You know, you can use questions to start children talking about tasks, how they do it. And I'm just trying to set the scene in the background here to give you a bit of an idea of the imagery, and then I will show you how you can use it. Size and scale, really, really important. I mean, here we're looking at a close-up. We certainly would not want to be this close to the sun. That would be really bad, okay? Um, you can see, I mean, does anybody know how many planet Earths you could fit inside the sun? Three billion. It's, it's a bit less, about, about 1.3, 1.4 million planet Earths. You know, so, so our perception, there's, to give you a rough idea, if you look at the size of the Earth, and there's the sun. Uh, and of course, our perception is that, you know, our sun is really big compared to us. But then, you know, how does that compare to other stars in the night sky? Are they all the same age? You know, are they all the same color? No, they're not. What's going on? Um, if I now put our sun beside the red giant of Betelgeuse in the shoulder of Orion the Hunter, so 1.3 million planet Earths fit on our sun, the size of this star, my goodness. If that star was where our sun is now, it would swallow the Earth. It would swallow us right out to Mars, right out to Jupiter. And our sun will eventually become a star like this. It's about life, life cycles. Stars are like everything in nature. They're, they, they are born, they live, and they do eventually die. So there's a whole stellar life cycle you can talk about there. Right, distance scale measure. This is, is a tricky one. So I think there's quite a few mathematicians here in the audience. So how do you measure space? Because it's not just about exploration, it's about collecting data and measuring stuff. So the first thing we need to know is the distances. So that's a big number to start with, 150 million kilometers. How do you connect a number like that to young people? Um, I have an idea. Can you all hold your thumb up for me? Hold your thumb up. Yeah. Hold your thumb. Yeah. We're very attached to your thumb. Yeah. How would you measure your thumb? What would you use? A ruler. Yeah. A ruler. Or you, yeah, you could probably draw a line right through it. What units? We're going to go metric. So what units would we use? Centimeter, and if you want to be a bit more pernickety, no, let me explain. Pernickety means accurate, okay? That's not an hour. Yeah, centimeters. Really. What about the width of this room? Meters. Meters, and if you don't want the rain to come in, centimeters, millimeters. Um, what about from here to Birmingham? 
Yeah, well, let's take the kilometer. So you can use kilometers in space, but it's an inappropriate unit. We're not only talking about distance, we're talking about units here, units of measurement. So that's quite a difficult concept, 150 million kilometers. Hold your thumb up again. This time, your thumb is incredibly big. It's the biggest thumb you've ever seen. Your thumb is now the distance between the sun and the earth. So that's easier to use. So instead of saying 150 odd million, you say one thumb. Now it's not called a thumb, of course. It is called an astronomical unit, AU. Wait, if you didn't know that, you just learned a new term. Millimeter, centimeter, meter, kilometer, distance to the sun, astronomical unit. There's a, a new unit. Um, that's really good, because now we can ask the students measure the distance in kilometers to the other planets of the solar system and then create a graph and say do it you know for astronomical units so for example if you go out to pluto little dwarf pluto it's uh, oh, okay so i'll come back to that in a minute i'll come back to that in a minute um but pluto 40 astronomical units 40 thumbs away it's a nice way to measure things that's from the sun so some so sun earth so 40 is the distance to pluto that's an easy number. That's quite easy to understand. Okay. Although I, I would also, I'll also tell you later. I'll show you about a solar system scale model. You have to be very careful if you create actually the sun this size, because you'll find Pluto is about four kilometers away on the scale. But we'll discuss that. We'll discuss this in a second. Okay. But that's Pluto. What about the stars in the night sky? They're much further away. In fact, the nearest star or system of stars, Alpha or Proxima Centauri. Is 63,000 thumbs away on the scale. Astronomical units. Again, that's an inappropriate unit, so it's great for here. Kilometers are great for the Earth. Astronomical units are great for the solar system. But in terms of space, it's no use. We need another unit. What unit do we use? Do we know? Yeah, light or light second or light minute. Yeah. Um, let me explain that to you. We're going to leave London and go to the moon. So I will count three, two, one. We will clap. And when we get to the moon, we will clap again. Okay? So three, okay, so the thumbs. Three, two, one, clap, clap. No, some of you went all the way there and back again. It's really quick, okay? So three, two, one, clap, clap. Yeah, one or two seconds from here to the moon. Wow. That's so, uh, light, we use that as a measure of distance. And this is where you can really engage with kids in several levels because. Have a think about this. If it takes about two seconds for the light to go to the moon, how long does it take for the light to come back? About two seconds. Whoa. So that means you're not seeing the moon as it is now. You're seeing the moon as it was two seconds ago. It takes two seconds. It's actually looking back in time. Astronomers are actually time travelers. We look back in time. When you see the sun, of course you never look at the sun through binoculars or a telescope, when you see the sun's Eight minutes it took the light. You're looking back in time. When you look at the stars in the sky with the naked eye, you're looking back thousands and thousands of years. With binoculars, millions of years. With a telescope, billions of years. Hubble can look back in time about 14 billion years. That's about three times the age of planet Earth itself. And the light is only arriving tonight. So, I mean, incredible stuff. So, you can use light, light years, as I say. Uh, the nearest stars can say 270,000 AU, that's 4.3 light years away. Now, let's go back to that assessment. Remember we said state the way to measure G and I said state A way? The old way would be, tell me what the speed of light is, take a box, you've answered the question. But of course, using the other way, personal capabilities and thinking skills, the question becomes more, can you find out how many light years or kilometers has, uh, light has traveled since you were born? That's a good question, isn't it? So think, how, I was born, what age am I now? How far has light travelled? Then you can get them to do it in light years, maybe kilometres. They realise that's an inappropriate unit. So then you can use standard form. You can actually use standard form and standard location to actually look at those scales. And it's just a really nice way to introduce very simple mathematical science. Or can you find something in the night sky that is that distance away from Earth? Now, that's interesting. Can they research and look at this and say, my goodness, can I find the star that when I was born, the light left it, and it's only arriving in the RIs tonight. And you can do it, but unfortunately the, the website's a bit slow. I'll try it again later. There's a free website I will show you at the end where you can type in your birthday, 
and I would actually go to a catalogue of real, a real catalogue of stars, and actually pinpoint the star where the light left when you were born. And that's really cool. You can really bring it to life. Really bring the subject to life. Um, if you want to Google it, by the way, if I forget, it's ESO Birthday Stars. ESO Birthday Stars. But I think I have all of this on the list um, at the end. We've come a long way. Um, about 400 years ago, this belonged to Galileo Galilei. He did not invent the telescope. He's just one of the very first people to look up. And of course, before Galileo, many people thought that we were at the centre of everything. And it's, it's very easy to think that. If you knew nothing about science, you see the sunrise in the east and set in the west. You see the stars and the moon move across. So you think everything's going around you. It wasn't. A lot of people th thought and hypothesised that we didn't go round. Everything went round. We went round the sun. But it wasn't until Galileo and, and colleagues at that time were able then to look at the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Mercury and Venus that that was observational proof that no, 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 the, the sun's actually in the centre. Didn't work out too well for Galileo, he, he ended up under house arrest. And, and I can't believe what I've heard in the news recently about the, uh, the seismologists in Italy. It's about like 400 years ago they've been put under arrest because they got it wrong. What about the bankers? Why are they not on them? You know, why are they not in jail? But all right, so that was 400 years ago. Telescopes have moved on. There's lots of really powerful telescopes now. Um, and people always say, why do you always need a, a bigger telescope? But a telescope is a light bucket. And if I'm talking to young people, what I would say is, if you go to the beach and you want to do a sand castle with water, you, know, the, you use a bucket to collect more water. Well, the bigger the bucket, the fainter photons we can gather. So really, it's bigger is better in cases. Um, some of them are truly fantastic instruments. Uh, this is the VLT, the Very Large Telescopes. Um, there's four together. Um, they're, they're big beasties. Okay, it's a beautiful image. That's in the Atacama Desert in Chile. I mean, the geology is fantastic. It's three kilometers above sea level. It hasn't rained in a hundred years. Beautiful night skies. I should also point out that astronomers are not very good at naming things. They're good at science. I give, I give you an example. This is called the VLT. That stands for Very Large Telescope. We're now building a bigger one. We're going to imaginatively call it the ELT. What do you think that stands for? Larger. Extremely large telescope. Yeah. So, so don't let them name your cat. It'll be very unimaginable. Okay. But, but um, this is an artist's impression. Uh, you can, there's the cars. This is big. This is this is big. This is a billion euro engineering project at the start. I'm actually on the procurement team for this. This is a, a, a billion euro project. Okay. It, it's going to be in the same. It's, it's across. If you imagine. The VLT in the Atacama Desert over here, Parnell, it's actually on another side. Because there is not a room. We actually have to blow up the entire top of the mountain to put it up there. Okay? And I'll give you an idea of how sensitive this instrument is. Um, you, you've all seen a floodlight at a stadium? Yes? You know floodlights that light up stadiums at night? This will be looking for planets that go around other stars. And the analogy to this is imagine a floodlight. Okay, so you're staring at a floodlight, you have one LED, one little LED light, 10 centimeters away from the floodlight, so that's what you're looking for, and you're standing 200 kilometers away. That's the sensitivity that you have to have to get this. I mean, it really is truly incredible. So this will revolutionize, the next 10, 20 years, this will revolutionize astronomy again from the ground. A lot of really amazing tasks and challenges around this. And just to give you an idea, uh, somebody's stolen the Arc de Triomphe and stuck it up here, but that gives you an idea of the size of this thing. I mean, these, these are big, big things. But again, I see you sitting there going, that's great, but I can't use that. How do we, how do we engage with this sort of instruments? It may have archive data, but how can we play with real instruments? How do we play with real technology? And I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, we also listen to the sky, of course. So we, we visualize the sky and we listen to it using our, things like radio antennas. Uh, this is false color, so using different parts of the spectrum, we can put together images like this. So you can look at the star forming, the blue regions here, a lot of hot gas and hydrogen. So you can, you can do a lot of really interesting stuff with these sort of images. But we have a problem. You've got to get above the atmosphere. If you want to see everything, you have to get above. <coughs> the atmosphere means a lot of the information you want to see, and I use the word see, is hidden from us. 
And this is just a little graph to show you. That's, that's what we see in the electromagnetic spectrum, of course. But all of this, and this, and this, does not go through the atmosphere. So if you want to see the big picture, you need to get above the atmosphere. If you want to see everything, get the big picture. And that's just an idea. In Europe, this is just NASA and Europe satellites at the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see there's a whole host of spaceships up there looking at it. And we use all of them to build up one picture, the, the big picture of, of the universe. Now, great synergy, but building the case for space, I mean, how, where did we start in Northern Ireland? It's always good to see where we actually started 11 years ago. Uh, I worked at the Arma Planetarium, okay, it's a science center. Um, when I started, that's what it looked like. It wasn't too hot, okay? Um, there was actually asbestos in the floor of my workshop, which was not so good. This is what it looks like now. Uh, Brian, Brian, Brian Spanking you, we're very pleased. We actually won Best Planetarium in the World last year. So, and there was only three of us to really get this all started again. So how did we lobby, how do we use education to get our science center open again? Because that's really, really important. A lot of traditional resources, but they tend to be one-off activities to inspire people rather than long workshops. Have you all seen these? Have you all? Yeah. Where you from? Yeah, some of you may have. These are a portable inflatable planetariums where you inflate them, you go inside, it projects the night sky, and you can get 30 kids in. So this is what we used to have to do. You get, this is actually in a beautiful hall. You get some really nice locations. Um, this is the Ulu Max uh, Theatre. This is graduation, the graduation ceremony, ceremonial place at Cork University, University of Cork. Um, and we get the kids in. So these are great because they're portable. But it's a one-off experience. It's just a one-off experience. So it's not going to really influence, maybe one or two. But it's not going to change the way kids or teachers think. Science festivals, I saw some people mentioning this. I mean, Ireland is well known for its science festivals. Big, big groups of people coming in, showing off their projects. Uh, somebody mentioned it's really important, I agree. If you have a project, show it off to the rest of the school and to the parents. I think that's really important. Well, look, we do it in really big style in Ireland, okay? Um, well, yeah, this was in Limerick. This shows you the power of space and astronomy. Kids are fascinated. This was advertised about four days beforehand. 1,400 kids came up to listen to me, God bless them. But I thought, I thought it was something important on the stage. Yeah. Um, and all I can say, has anybody ever seen the film Gremlins? If you remember the film Gremlins? This is a bit like the, the scene in the cinema with Gremlins, okay? It's, uh, there was 1,400 of these kids, but it was very inspirational. And the kids got really interested, but they're one-off activities. Again, not exactly STEM, but it does show you you can have a cross-curricular approach. This is the brass band in a place called Newton Abbey, which is where I live, and they were playing space-themed music. So during the day, the students would actually be doing science and learning about the planets, learning about the stars, and then there would be a musically-themed concert. Taking that one step forward, the Ulster Orchestra, here's the portable planetarium, these are professional musicians, they work with very young people, so we talk about the science of astronomy, okay? What it might be like to live or, or to travel to those worlds. And then the actual musicians create with the young people little compositions of, of what they think it should sound like. And this was, uh, the orchestra was playing the Planet Suite, very appropriately. So on the opening night, these kids came up and played their own compositions. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then working with those that don't normally engage in science, this is a North Belfast uh, school. Um, you know, their perceptions were quite localized of their own area. This was after we'd shown some images of space and astronomy and art. And then they had to create these fantastic, and this is like only after half an hour. And they started with a professional artist, started creating their own scenes. It had changed the way they perceived it, their imagination. Um, rocket launching is always great. This is very rare. It's a blue sky in Ireland. It's a very, very rare image. Um, this is building, launching rockets, a lot of science, very simple little bits of kit where they blast this stuff off. And then the next step for us was how do you keep the engagement going? How do you engage? So astronomy at this point was not in the curriculum, okay? It wasn't there. But of course there's physics, there's optics, there's light, you know, in biology, there's evolution and chemistry, you know, how are things made, you know, the, chemics, the chemistry of the universe. So we created Astrogazers Ireland. And this I'm just saying, I'm just floating these ideas. Um, this was a group of schools who showed an interest in astronomy and wanted to create astronomy clubs. 
So we created two or three school teacher mentors, people like yourselves who are passionate about your subject, and then they helped me with a little bit of funding, a very small amount of funding. Uh, we actually got our local energy supplier, Northern Ireland Electricity, to give us some funding. And they, they started working, and then they started creating their own projects. These are first year boys um, looking at the life cycle of a star, they created something. Um, the girls were uh, looking at diet on board the International Space Station. So really what they were looking at were the consequences, consequences of poor diet and nutrition, but they used astronaut training. And they trained younger kids in, in the way astronauts are trained, but what they actually did was looking at the consequences of poor diet. And these kids were actually using one of their very old telescopes um, to look at Jupiter, to recreate some experiments that Galileo would have done. So working together, this showed our government, the Department of Education, that there was an interest. So again, astronomy wasn't embedded in the curriculum, but we were building up a lobby, an interest group, an astronomy interest group, that could then, when the curriculum was to be revised and refined, it, was, it wasn't me, it was these teachers going to government saying, we want astronomy in the curriculum. So it's a bit sneaky, but that's how we did it. And it worked very well because I have learned politicians anywhere in the world, they will sign anything as long as somebody else said they did it. You know, so you know, they, will, they will not justify anything unless uh, um, there, there's a rationale behind it. So that has worked very well for us. That allowed us to start bringing astronomy into the curriculum. Um, and also, we work with teachers beyond science. Uh, when I said beyond science, I'm talking about our, our friends in geography. And this was, uh, I'm going to show you this site in a minute. Uh, this is the ESA Edu Space. This is the European Space Agency's portal to Earth observation and remote sensing data. So our colleague from the Czech Republic, you were mentioned about GIS and this material. Well, this is, I will show you the, the repository for all the data over the last 20 years and lots of uh, free downloadable PDFs how to use the data and use the software. And also uh, working with those within Europe. Uh, if anyone's uh, from the Netherlands, you may recognize this, Andre Kuiper, the astronaut, who went up for three months recently. He came over and uh, we, we got them together. So it was about building up this lobby, but also building up interest. And uh, working with this group now uh, um, across Europe, so finding like-minded people, like yourself, okay, joining hands and actually creating this European hands-on universe program, which now is part of the global hands-on universe program, which I'm going to give you the website because it's something you may want to get involved in because there's lots of resources and we're always keen to see people coming into the door. And again, GAIS was mentioned yesterday, um, also working with industry because there is a need, there's a need for this stuff. So working with the European Space Agency Education, uh, I know Israel, for example, it has its own space agency and its own outreach program, so maybe worth working with them. URC, this was um, looking at case examples. This is how companies, SMEs, business use uh, data to improve their service or improve efficiency. So these websites are all completely free and you can download this stuff. So if you're looking at business cases of why we use space to improve efficiency or capacity or capability, you can do it this way. So why bother? Okay, it's a good question. Why bother? That's okay. Why should we go? Well, in the UK, I'm pretty sure if you look at your government's policies towards space and astronomy, it's a growth sector. There's, a, there's, a, there's an economic reason. Not just in STEM, but in this case in space. Um, we now have a space agency. We have, we have a space center. We now have an agency in the UK. And it has, it's aligned, completely aligned with the government strategies. I, I'm not going to read through it all, but you'll see, very importantly, Science is an enabler of growth for the space sector and education for growth. These are key policies of the UK government. So it ties into this. And it's a big industry. Um, yes, we, have, we, have, we also have a strategy now and a program of how to grow this over the years. So there is a need for this stuff in the curriculum to get that next generation of young scientists and engineers. And to give you an idea, this is the forecast. And this is, a, a, this is an estimate. The, the entire global industry by the year 2030, it'd be worth 400 billion pounds. That's a lot of money. In the UK alone, the very ambitious goals, the UK wants to capture 10%. You know, 40 billion, industry worth 40 billion in the UK alone. So we need those graduates coming through. We need those young people. So there's not a business case. It's not just a case of education. There's a need for these young people. And very, very important, it's going to be the applications and services. 
what we call the downstream sector. Not the big rocket motors and the spaceships, but using data, being able to get that space drive data I talked about to create new applications, satellite navigation, GIS, GPS. So this is the business need. There's a real need for this stuff. Okay, all the interesting stuff that you guys want to hear. What are the resources? How can you use them? I'm going, not going to look at them all because there is a plethora. I want to use the ones that you can get engaged with and the ones that you can take away or work with us to get engaged. And I'll explain the mechanisms as we go along. Um, it really is quite exciting because at the minute there are robotic telescopes. We're, we're building global networks of robotic telescopes. When I say we, in the UK, this came through the Dill Fox Educational Trust and the John Moores, Liverpool John Moores University. And these are big beasties. So you have one telescope in Australia, you have another one over here in the big mountain, Haleakala, over in Hawaii, and one in the Canaries, the Liverpool Telescope. So this gives us global coverage of the night sky. They are research grade telescopes, so astronomers want to have time on them. But importantly, school children in the UK and Ireland can get time on these telescopes. Now, I want to hear thinking, well that's great if it's UK and Ireland. But let me explain the mechanism by how you can actually get involved with this. Um, they are different. I mean, normally you think of a telescope, yeah, and a dome with a slit, yeah. But these are robotic, so if you have a dome that needs to turn and a telescope that needs to turn, there's a lot of problems. So it's like a clamshell. The entire dome comes away, revealing the telescope inside. There's a person. So these aren't small telescopes you can buy in a shop, you know. These are 10 million pounds worth of telescopes, uh, available freely for schools to use. It's quite a resource. Um, this, this is just some of the ideas of how it is perceived using it. I'm going to give you the website to have a look at in a minute, and you can actually look at all of the resources that are there. They're all mapped out, mostly generic. They're mapped to our curriculum, but you will see the strands. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of links there. Uh, an interesting <laughs> photo. This is the man that gave us the money. This is what you do when you've got a lot of money, obviously. Um, this is Bill Fox. Uh, he's got both hands put there. Okay, forget that. But uh, he put ten million pounds of his own money into the thing. He's actually a dot com. He actually comes from the dot com industry. Um, he's a bit of a gambler, too. So ten million from him. Uh, One million pounds. It was the Particle Physics Astronomy Research Council. It's now the STFC, the Swindon Town Football Club, or or the Science Technology Facilities Council. And 600,000 came from the Department uh, for Education and Skills, or Employment and Skills. Um, just to give you a rough idea, I mean, they are research grade. You know, they've got all the filters, all the technology you would require as a professional scientist to do real science. So they're, re they're real telescopes. They don't look at the entire next guy. They're not a wide field of view. They have a very small field of view. If you imagine this is the full moon, that's the size of the image you're getting. So they're not very good if you want to look at the Milky Way in all its splendor. Very small field of view, very accurate. Okay. Uh, there's, this gives you an idea of the geology of where they are. This is in Mount Haleakala. You can see in Hawaii the clouds underneath you. There's the Fox, our little telescope there. Lots of different telescopes. I believe this is a super secret American military base, which you can probably see from Mars. It's so shiny, but these are all telescopes run by, run by the University of Hawaii. Look at the geology here. This is in Australia, in Siding Springs. This is the other telescope. Um, it's, it's interesting to note, I think somebody might be able to tell me in Australia there's something like 16 of the most venomous and dangerous creatures live in Australia, is that right? 10 or 16? So if that's not a good reason to have a robotic telescope and remotely controlled, I don't know. But it gives you that ability to look at the night sky. And of course, it's nine hours ahead of us in the UK and the other one is 11 hours behind us, which is perfect for the school day. So during the school day, it's night time at those sites, allowing you to observe through the telescopes. The primary goals, as you can imagine, is STEM, uh, post 14 audience, okay, because you need a little bit of understanding how to use it. And the idea is to work on real science projects with real scientists collecting real data using real technology. So it's not a, it's not a toy, it's a real scientific project. And one of the things that we're very interested in doing with this group is that at the end of this talk, if any of you are interested in using this, because it is free to schools in the UK and Ireland at the minute, but not globally. But we're hoping that schools, I know as a teacher at the very back, if you put your hand up, put them on the spot, uh, who's very interested in, in using this technology. If your school wants to work with school children and scientists in the UK, 
we'd be happy to facilitate that if we could uh, talk to Daniel afterwards. So you can actually use these telescopes if you want, uh, working through the group. Um, there's two ways you can do it. You can either do it offline by submitting a request to the website, so you have a rough idea what you want to look at and, and you know, where it's going to be. If it's not, time, if the, if the variable of time does not matter. Unless it's something you need to see live at a certain time, you can submit it and then whenever the telescope's free, it will just go and take your image. The other way to do it is live sessions. You can book a half hour session and this big telescope will turn around and actually send your image back to your computer on the screen, which is really very, very cool if you get it from the kids. So the minute we're working with the UK, US, Irish and Australian astronomers, uh, we'll be very, <coughs> very keen, as I say, it carries out real research projects using real data and real scientists. So we're very keen to team up scientists, whether it be here or in, in your country, with your school, with kids and scientists in this country, and do some real some research on real projects. I think that's a fantastic project to actually work on. I'll give you an idea of just how good the telescopes are. This is the, the pillars of creation. This is a giant molecular cloud where stars are born. This is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is quite expensive, as you can imagine, you know, tens of billions of dollars. This is the same image taken with the Fox Telescope. To give you an idea, I think you agree that's pretty good. You know, that, that's Hubble in space, and that's the Fox Telescope. That's an image taken by that telescope. So they really are fantastic resources. They're not going to be disappointed when you see an image for this. It's really, really incredible. Now, the other way we might get involved in this is through Mr. Wayne Rosing, who's the uh, Senior uh, Vice President of Engineering of a little search engine you've probably heard of, called Google. Um, we like him a lot, and there's a very good, well, several good reasons. One of them is, he's very, very rich, which is great. Uh, I'm very, very keen to get involved on astronomy. And he is looking to set up a global network of these telescopes and smaller telescopes. And this will probably be in the next five, ten years. The idea being, that you can basically Google the sky anywhere in the world and get your own live data. So by getting involved in something like Fox now, we'll set you up to get used to these things coming online in the next five, ten years. Uh, just a little bit about Wayne Rosen himself, I'll just let you read it there. But he is a legend, you know, in Silicon Valley. He created a lot of the stations, the Apple, everything, you know, those stations, the subsystems. He was the inventor for a lot of it, so I mean, an incredible guy. And he's also really keen on uh, surveys of the night sky using these large telescopes and data streams. To give an idea of some, one of the other projects he's working on, which is just incredible. Um, this is going to be a telescope that can actually map the entire night sky every night. So each image will be three gigapixels. Um, every night it will be downloading 30 terabytes of data. That's a lot of data. I say operational because it's not operational yet. But all of that data is going to be available. And, you know, there's no way the science field will be able to get through all of that data. So there's a lot of projects that will come out of that archive data as well as the live data. And the plans are to build another five of those big ones that I showed you around the world so we have true domains of science. There will be new instrumentation on the telescopes. Uh, upgrade them, the, the ones that we've got there, 2 meter, 2.5, uh, and eventually free access for every school in the world. So I'm very keen, if there's anybody in this audience, please do say to me and Daniel, and we'll try and link you up with that network, with the schools maybe in the UK and Ireland, to do real projects. I think it's a fantastic thing. If out of this, for, for me, if out of this uh, event, those two or three schools that got a chance to use these telescopes to do real science, real scientists, I think that's a, that's a winner for us. So that's really, really good. Uh, just now give some of the images, if you can see, before I let you have a play on some of the stuff. Um, you can do all sorts of really cool things. This is just some of the projects. Near our objects. These are things that might one day warp us. So watching our flame is really important. And the kids can do some real science by seeing you know, how the rotation, what their orbits are. We have students in Northern Ireland who have found two new asteroids. This is the thing, these are research grade telescopes. The kids can actually find them and get their name against them. They've found something new in the heavens. I think it's fantastic. And the, these telescopes I'm talking about are the largest that regularly look out for asteroids and comets that might come towards us. This is really important research. You know, we don't want to be the dinosaurs again, yeah? Dinosaurs part two. And this, this is an idea that some of the girls that have been working on, these young girls, uh, were looking at the Earth objects. They work now, they work with astronomers in Northern Ireland, professional astronomers, to map them, to find out how to do the project. But it was the girls that took the images and did all the metrics and the scientists set up the scientific rigor. So this is a real project with these kids. Uh, this was at the BT Young Scientist uh, event. Um, so they were up, but against a wee bit of competition here. This is 
1,800 science projects. Okay, this is, this is in Ireland. It's a truly amazing thing. If you ever get a chance, try and come over and see it. And there's several ways you can link that into the classroom. Let's, I want to try that now. So, first thing I'm going to, now, well, not all these internet is so unfortunately I'll do this at the front, but I'm going to let you have a go at something else in a second. And I'm just going to come out of this. Um, hopefully, this is a free piece of software, and again, I will give you the website at the end to have a go. Um, before in class, well, if you were looking at impacts before in the classroom, what you probably would have done is you would have had ball burns or different metrics. You'd have sand or flour. You would drop something into it and you, you would see the impact. But it really doesn't give you an idea of what happened to the dinosaurs by doing that. You know, it re really doesn't. And you don't want to recreate that because you will all die. So, you know, how do you recreate this? This is called Down to Earth, okay? You can actually, I'll give you the website at the end. So let's put in a few parameters. So here's our asteroid. And this isn't multilingual, by the way. It's multilingual. So now the first thing kids will do will be this. Big, big asteroid, okay? 15 kilometers cost. But I'm going to go for something a bit smaller. Um, say about five kilometers across. They the think that's about the size they want to wipe out the dinosaurs. So that sounds okay. Uh, trajectory angles. You can work out what angle you want it to come in. And go bit, again, kids will do this. Okay? <laughs> um, but, okay, I'll put it in about. Uh, the velocity of the thing, so you can rev it up whatever way you want. Okay, and then projectile. So this is based on real physics. Okay, this is based on, on real physics. Uh, projectile density. So what's it going to be made of? It's going to be like a comet. Dense rubber made of iron. Let's make it out of iron. Just be really nasty. So we've got a 5.2 kilometer uh, iron asteroid heading straight towards us at 50 uh, kilometers a second. And um, what's going to hit? Um, well, it really doesn't matter, it's, probably, it's going to be pretty bad, you know. But, but we'll go for sedimentary rock, okay. And then, how far are you away, which is very important, <laughs> crashing. Um, again, it's really not going to matter with a five kilometer cross asteroid, but we'll put you a hundred kilometers away, okay. Okay, and then you submit this. Ah, Northern Ireland, okay. So now you can have the fun with Google Earth of placing where the thing is going to walk. You know, so in Ireland, as you can imagine, with uh, with our heritage of the troubles, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but I'll just grow up where I live. Okay, there's Newton Abbey. Um, okay, okay, now usually, okay, it's the internet again. Usually, it comes up with a big explosion, but you can see the actual values. These are mapped. These are real values. Of something in. So you can see that's a big crater. Okay, in the ground. Um, yeah, 80 kilometers across. Uh, the thickness of the the stuff that would actually come out of it. The wind velocity. Uh, what I would measure in the Richter scale, you know, uh, the sound plus 148 decibels, and that's 100 kilometers away. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, crater size. Let's have a look at crater depth. Okay, so big hole in the ground. And now we can select landmarks. So, well, we're in London, yeah, so Big Ben. So, what would Big Ben look like in that hole? Oh dear, it's not so good, is it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then we can actually look at the data view, what it would look like in the data side of things. I think it's, it's, it's pretty bad, really. You know, your clothing ignites. Uh, if you're 100 kilometers away, much of the bottom of the third grade, newspaper, plywood flames, deciduous trees ignite. Um, Armageddon, really, yeah. Um, multi walls, spurring, buildings collapse, wooden frames. But what I would say, small villages will collapse. Um, this you don't want to be there, it's really bad, okay? But what you can do is you can use that, and then you can use in the classroom the old ball bearing experiment, you know? So you can do a physical experiment, or you can lead it by some, using something like this, which is virtual. The thing about this is it gives you all the real physics, the real maths and the real physics. So the other one, they actually try to experiment it themselves with different variables, but then they can do the, the real thing, you know, the, a real asteroid in virtual reality. Another really interesting experiment that you can do, I don't think I put it up here. Or, don't worry, I'm just like, not thinking about this is for another job. Um, I just want to get back to where we were. Because you're going to have a go at the end thing now. Um, this uh, capturing micromedia X. This is a really interesting little project you can do with your kids or do at home. Okay. So you need to find a gutter, a, a drain pipe. Yeah. Uh, not a metal drain pipe, a PVC or plastic drain pipe. Preferably one that's really dirty. Okay. One that's really dirty. Or a roof that hasn't been cleaned in a while. So this is anybody's normal house. Okay. Or building. Put a bucket underneath where the spout comes down, okay? 
And then after a heavy rainfall, I know it sounds a bit yucky, but kids love this anyway. Lift, lift the material. Bring it inside, take out all the really nasty stuff, bits of leaves or whatever else is in there. So you're just left with the mushy stuff that's come off the roof. Then what you do is you dry that. So you get some newspaper or white paper, you spread it out. If you have an oven in the classroom, and it's good if you have one of the ovens to desiccate it, a desiccator, put it in there, but let it dry out completely. Once that has dried out, it's very simple. So you're with me so far here? Yeah? So then you, you, you rub the stuff out so it's nice and flat, and then you get a magnet. And this is the really cool bit. You run the magnet over that mush that's now dried out, and you'll see bits of metal maybe sticking to the magnet. You then take those little bits of stuff that have stuck to the magnet and put it on a petri dish and look underneath the microscope. Now if there's anything in that dish that is circular, that is spherical, that's a meteorite from outer space. You've actually just cracked it off your roof. There's thousands of tons of stuff in space. That little piece that you've collected off the roof is actually probably about 5 billion years old. It is actually a part of shattered innards of a planet in your petri dish that you've collected off the roof. So you've collected your own piece of space. Very easy little practical. So you can start with something like that, use a simulator, and then do it the traditional way, like dropping the ball breaks. All real physics and all real science, but it really stimulates the kids. They're doing real stuff. Now, I've dabbled on long enough here at the front, I think, as 